let's get started so last time uh, what did we derive the main relation we derived is that zwanzig perturbation relation which is if you have a complicated n body interaction and uh, the it's clearly been bothering alex a lot with the notation and that's why i can't help it that's chandler's notation right r capital n means un that depends on small r1 small r2 up to small rn, where each of these themselves is a vector. That's the idea, right? This is r1x, so it's three n numbers, rnx, rny, rnz. So you have a complicated n-body potential. It could be a sum of pair interactions, it could be triplets, it could be some complicated n-body potential. So the idea is that if un of rn can be written as a simpler, uh, u of rn, which is some reference potential, plus a perturbation u1 that also depends on rn. It could be simple, it could be complex, that's up to you. In such a case, the partition function for the true n-body system, and, and this is our reference potential u0, depends on the partition function, and these are all in principle n-body potentials. So the partition function for the true system depends on the partition function of the reference system through this relation, e to the power minus beta u n one zero. And I will show you today how we can calculate such a thing. So that will maybe remove some of the uh, uh, enigma about what such a thing actually means. Go ahead. For um, systems of liquids, gases, huh? when can you write the total chemical partition function as pairwise products of partition functions for individual atoms, assuming you have? No. Nothing can be done for individual atoms. This is only for n-body system. But for an, in, for an independent, non-interacting system, we could write it. If it is independent, non-interacting, right? for interacting system. Yeah, yeah, and life is interaction, right? So that's the problem. So this, this is equation one. This is exact, right? That is the point. This is always true, whether this is practical or not, that's another story. So last time we went through a bit of math and the idea was, uh, let's call this equation zero, that given equation zero, what can we say about the Helmholtz free energy? for the true n-body system in terms of the Helmholtz free energy of the reference system plus Helmholtz free energy that is different from the reference system, right? We tried to derive an expression for this in the high temperature beta limit. The algebra was a bit messy, but I, I didn't realize that I could actually do it in two lines, at least for the first term in beta. And hopefully this, you will remember this and see why it's so simple. So in order to do this, for, uh, so we look at right-hand side of equation one. So those of you who came late, I'm just summarizing what I did last time. I talked about Zwanzig's exact relation, which is equation number one. And then I said, I want to derive a contribution to the Helmholtz free energy, which is valid in the high temperature, limit, right? So how do I do that? So in order, and I went through a lot of algebra, I can actually do it much in a much simpler way. So the right-hand side of equation one, is going to look at, <clears throat> look like EX, average value of, this thing calculated in uh, the reference ensemble. And to get the Helmholtz free energy, we need to take the log of this, right? And the problem is we cannot take the log of this because it's log of average of exponential, right? We cannot just magically pop the lab log inside and it's done. Go ahead, Sophia, you have a question. That's one six really. Oh, I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about this one. Zn naught will always stay. Zn naught, the whole hope is, I'm just talking about that part. I'm not talking about, sorry. So, okay, fine. <laughs> right-hand side of right-hand side of equation one, okay? <laughs> so, because Zn naught, the idea is if you have a simple reference system, you can calculate it easily. And I will show you how it can be done to pick it easy enough. So in order to do this, and eventually we need the log of this thing, we cannot just pop the log inside. So, so the idea is, and this is basically the idea and what I did last time, is to write it down inside the bracket. What is this going to be? We can write down the value of the exponential, right? What is e to the power minus x? That is one minus x plus x squared plus two factorial, right? So this is one minus beta un one plus beta square un one whole square by two factorial minus beta cube, dot, 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 right? Calculated in this one. 
So at this point, if you're willing to assume that you are working in the high temperature limit, which means small beta, right? It's already okay to say that let's just stop at the first term over here, right? Let's not worry about the second term. So what does this become? If you stop at high temperature or low beta, this thing becomes approximately one minus beta u and one in the reference ensemble, right? We can ignore the beta square beta q term, right? Everyone okay with this? So now the nice thing is there is no exponential, right? And this can be written as the average of one. What is the average of one? That is one minus average of beta u and one. What is beta? Beta is, we are working in canonical ensemble, right? So beta comes out. So this is beta average of u and one in the canonical ensemble. Now we can do kind of a clever trick. We can recognize, well, this is the same as approximately e to the power minus beta average of u and one in the reference ensemble, right? So is this clear what I did here? I wrote down the exponential, I expanded the series, then I said, well, let's ignore the high temperature beta terms, uh, high beta terms, uh, beta, beta to the higher power terms because it's, low te uh, it's high temperature or low beta. So I'm left with only linear in beta. So now I can bring it down. Then I realized, well, actually it looks like this. So in, in what I have done effectively is something which is almost like magic. I have said that EXP of minus beta UN1 in the reference ensemble or in any ensemble actually is approximately EXP of minus beta average of U and one. So the thing that you really want at only at high T or low beta. So the thing that you really wanted to do is to put the average inside the log. You can actually do it. Even though it looks terrible, you can actually do it if the temperature is high enough or if beta is small enough, okay? So in other words, therefore we can write down. So those who came late, I'm saying that the algebra that I did last time can actually be done in two lines if you don't want to worry about exact contributions for the higher beta terms, beta higher power terms. If you want to do everything exactly, then you have to go through that algebra. But just for the dominant term in beta, it's actually very easy. So this gives us Zn is equal to approximately Zn naught multiplied by exp of minus beta u n one zero. Let's call this equation number two. How do I go from equation number two to free energy? To Helmholtz free energy, what should I do? Huh? Natural log and so what is the relation between A and Z? It is minus KBT log Z, right? So if I take natural log of this, what does this become? Ln Z n is equal to Ln Z n naught plus ln of exp of minus beta un1 zero. So the thing that you really wanted, I at least really wanted, is that ln and x cancel out can actually happen at high beta, sorry, at low beta, at low beta. Or ln zn is equal to ln zn naught minus beta average value of un one and zero. If you multiply by minus, if you if you divide by one minus one over beta both sides, you get minus one over beta ln zn is equal to minus one over beta ln zn naught plus u n one zero or a n is equal to a n zero plus u n one zero. This is what we showed last time, right? And then I also showed you pathway high to get the other terms that depend on beta. But the term that depends on beta to the power zero, you can get trivially. Go ahead, Kinja. So, uh, what happens if you redense You will have to be careful. <laughs> you should try. You will maybe get the same answer as you got last time, but you will have to be careful. That's the only thing in your series. You should get the same answer, but yeah, yeah. it's easy to make algebra error. That's why I stop here. You will end up doing what we did last time. If you did that, you will. You will if you are careful and you write higher order terms, you will discover the algebra from last time. Don't go into that. Okay, so 
Today, I will show you an actual example for why it's useful. We are going to set up a reference potential. We will set up a potential a perturbation and we will see what we get out of that, okay? So what I'm going to show you next is we are going to think about first wise. So today we will show how if your reference is equal to heart sphere interaction and your perturbation is equal to attractive forces because heart spheres don't really attract each other, attractive forces, then the result, the net result is equal to Van der Waals equation of state. And I like this a lot because in Van der Waals equation of state, if those of you who remember, there is a B term, there is an A term. And we say A term is something about attraction. You will see how the A term actually depends on the interactive potential. That's kind of nice. We will focus only on pair interactions, okay? To keep the math simple, focus only on pair interactions, which means that my U n, which is a function of all n coordinates, can be written as i more than j more than equal to one of small u r i minus r j. Okay, that's that's the pair interaction. So, so what does this mean? So I'm, I'm going to focus only on this thing, the small u, okay? I will, I'm not spitting the n body. Is there candy or something? Yeah. You can have it. <laughs> so small u of r is written as u heart sphere of r plus u one of r, which is some perturbation. So let's try to understand why we care about this and why this is very useful. So since Nathan has been reading a paper about Argon and Leonard Jones, in the paper that Nathan posted on the Slack general channel, if you open that paper, you will see a typical real world model of U of R, the pair interaction, right? Do you remember how does it look like, Nathan? Yeah, it's like, a, as it goes to zero, it goes to infinity. Yeah. Exactly. So as it goes to zero, it goes to infinity, then there is a tape, and then it goes like this, right? Anyone knows a mathematical term for such a curve? Leonard Jones is a typical way to do it. So this, so Leonard Jones, for example, says u by r is equal to a by r to the power 12 minus b by r to the power 6. Now, even though Vedan thinks if he scores an a in stat mech, he will be excused from stat mech. You are allowed in most, if, if you, yeah, here, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know what excuse, unless you are in physics, then you have a set exam. But in biophysics, especially, you will get questions on anything. This could be, for example, a stack my question as to why do you have R to R12, R to R6, you know, what's the origin of those things? I don't know whether that's stack mech or quantum mechanics, it's both. We won't get into that. This is, this is a curve. This is an equation that could be used to describe such a curve. Actually, similar curves apply for very complicated things also, such as two iron atoms talking to each other, which is really complex, right? You have these, P electrons and D electrons talking to each other. It won't be as simple. You will have little peaks in the middle corresponding to what exactly the electrons are doing. But this basic behavior that you have a certain distance at which a bond is formed. If you get too close, it says, get off me. If you could go too far, it says, come back. You know, that's, that's the simple picture. So this is, so we want to calculate the partition function and the Helmholtz energy for such a U of R. That's going to be complicated, right? None of our tricks are going to work because U of R is so complicated. We will have to do the math, it will be terrible. But this U of R can be written as a sum of two potentials. It can be written as a sum of a heart sphere potential and a perturbation. So let's see what I mean by that. So, First, let me draw the heart sphere potential. How does the heart sphere potential look like? U of R versus R. So it's, it's kind of like delta function until a certain value of the R, right? And then it drops to zero. So here it's infinity. And uh, let's call this as R less than sigma. And then it's zero, right? So it's, a, it's like a step function with delta, right? That's what it is. It's not a delta function. It's a step function with delta. What should I add to this 
hardware to get a potential that looks like the one on top. Any ideas? What is the hard sphere missing? It's missing an attractive interaction. How should an attractive in interaction look like? So this is my hard sphere. So what is the other term that I should add to it in order to get something that has the same physics? An attractive force. So how should attractive force look like? It should be under the axis. So it tells you that if you are far, it wants you to come back, right? And the closer you get, it says, come closer, come closer, come closer. But if you add both of these, at R more than sigma, which term will dominate? U of hard sphere or U1 of R? U1 of R, right? Because hard sphere is zero. There is nothing going on, right? And as you are at R less than sigma, the hard sphere term will dominate. Right? So if you strictly sum them up, how is it going to look like? It's going to look something like right? This is how the true sum will look like, which is not exactly what we wanted. Why? Because there is a problem here, right? What's the problem? It's got discontinuity. When your R is equal to sigma, the force will be crazy. You could don't have a force, right? So what's the way to solve the discontinuity? Ignore it. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't, don't, don't get it. Are, are you okay? <laughs> don't have such a nihilistic viewpoint for the discontinuity. The first way to introduce, ignore the discontinuity would be to scale this so that this thing looks like this, right? Can we do that? That's still attractive, right? Because potentials are only the gradients matter, right? So if you did red one, then it will look something like this, right? You still have a discontinuity, yeah. but you can play with it. What you can do is to introduce what is known as some spline functions over here, right? You can approximate something with something. And you can, but for a good approximation, for, for an okay approximation, this is fine. It kind of looks like Nathan's plot, right? Would you agree, Nathan? We depend on you. If you don't agree, then we are done. No, so please agree. But you see, right? It's telling you that less than R for, if R is less than Sigma, it blows up. It says, don't come closer. And if it, R is more than Sigma, it says, keep coming closer, right? That's the basic picture. And if you really want to account for this one, you should introduce some spline. So if you were, if you were Kinjal, for example, and you're coding up or swim and you're coding up a molecular dynamics code for it, it will blow up if you just coded the thing that I drew on top, right? So you will have to be a bit careful about things being continuous, but that's not too hard. That's just mathematical functions. Uh, in any way, you won't, you won't approximate the hard sphere with an exact line. You would approximate it with something like a very sharp Gaussian or something like that, right? So it's, it's, it's okay to do that. It's not hard, people can. So hopefully everyone is fine at this point that a typical Leonard Jones type interaction, which has repulsion in the very beginning, and attraction as you go far can be approximated with a hard sphere interaction plus a perturbation that is purely attractive. That is just telling you keep getting closer, keep getting closer, keep getting closer, right? There is nothing else. So we want to calculate the partition function for U of R. So let me number this equation. Uh, this equation is equation number three. So we have written down equation number three. And we want to calculate the partition function corresponding to U of R, which is the attraction and repulsion on the basis of this thing. So how do we do that? <clears throat> so our guiding principle will be to use Zwanzig's relation, which is Zn is equal to Zn zero average of EXP of minus beta UN one in the reference ensemble, right? But we will make an approximation. We will work only at higher temperatures, okay? At high T or low beta, this becomes Zn is approximately, and again, I cannot emphasize enough. The first one is exact, the second line is approximation. 
e to the power minus beta average of u n one in reference ensemble, right? So this is going to be the hard sphere partition function. And this is going to be a sad face because we have to do some algebra, okay? So what should we do first? What do we want me to do first? The sad face or the hard sphere partition function? You're all, what's the word for it? People who like sadness? No. Masochistic. Masochistic. Now I will do hard sphere partition function. Anti-Omar. No, we need first to make it happen. Okay, you make a very convincing case. <laughs> okay, let's do this. It's, it's not that bad. So, so we we already have written this equation. I will I will not. This is equation two, right? So we have to calculate equation two. So let's look at as Sophia made me label it right hand side of right hand side of equation two. Okay, so we will look at. And specifically, we are going to look at this thing. Let's try to calculate this one. This is kind of fun. It's not sad, it's actually good. So, how should we proceed? Any ideas? Let me give you a hint. Two classes before we wrote down an equation, we talked about average E of an interacting system coming from the kinetic energy that was three by two NKT, right? And we calculated the term for the potential energy. Anyone remembers what was that term? I gave you intuition for it, for pair interactions. One half, One half. dr of, and for radial systems, it's going to be four pi r square, u of r, but then you have to take into account the conditional probability g of r, and then the rho comes over here, right? That's what we had, and we had a n. We derived this a few classes ago. This is your intuition. So given this equation from, so this is from back in the day. Vedant has taught me I should use lots of acronyms. Okay, so given this, can anyone intuit? Well, it's not intuit, it's actually rigorous. What should be the value of u10? The same idea. Same n by two rho dr four pi r square g of r, but instead the tricky thing comes now which g of r should we use and which u of r should we use? The integral is being calculated in which ensemble? The reference ensemble. So, and pay attention because this is subtle. This g of r should be the g of r for the reference ensemble. And immediately you can see why this business is so nice. You don't have to use the g of r for the complicated system in this perturbation. You can use the g of r for the reference system. So you are doing some experiment on some complicated quantum nano polymer, and you don't know what's G of R because it won't work in your scattering. But if you know that the X interaction is a perturbation over some reference, you can use the G of R for the reference. And then what should be U of R? Should it, should it be hard sphere or the attractive perturbation? Should it be the reference potential or the perturbation potential? It's the perturbation potential, right? So this is going to be U1 of R, and I'm going to mark this as triple, quadruple, pentuple star. Because if the back in the day equation is clear to you, then this one is obvious. This equation will tell you whether you got the gist of zone six relation. If this is confusing you, then you do not understand zone six relation and you have to think a bit more. Okay, so we are going to use this. And it turns out this integral is really, really easy to do because in the class and in your homework, probably you have plotted G of R for hard sphere. Remember, we thought about that. G of R, G of R for hard sphere is actually easy. So let's, let's try to calculate this thing. Any questions about this? Okay. <clears throat> so first thing I'm going to do is to 
write down n is equal to rho b. I don't know why it's in my notes. So I'm going to do that. I think it simplifies things later. So if n is equal to rho b, then let, let me go to the next page because I can do all of that in one page. So I will just do this trivial substitution, then I will go to the next page. So this is rho square v by two integral dr four pi r square g hard sphere r u one r. So let's try to do this integral. So u n one zero, we just wrote on the last page is rho square v by two integral u one of r g hard sphere of r four pi r square dr. What does g hard sphere of r look like? As r tends to infinity, what should it become? Every g of r becomes one as r tends to infinity. Okay, it could be as complicated of a system as you want. As r tends to infinity, it should become one. As r tends to zero, what does the g of r for a hard sphere look like? Why? Yes, imagine iron as a hard sphere, right? So what is the probability of finding another hard sphere on top of iron if he's already a hard sphere with a finite radius? Zero, right? It's not going to happen. Now, if we shrunk iron to zero, then that changes, right? But if iron is truly a hard sphere of a finite radius, sorry, you're not a hard sphere with that. I should just volunteer myself if I am a hard sphere. So you don't want anything sitting on top of my head. So it's zero. So iron at what point, for how long should it stay zero? Until it hits the sigma or the radius of the radius or diameter. Wait, are we talking like a reference point from the center of the particle? <laughs> Good one. Yes. Then radius. Oh wait, no diameter. Because it's hard to <laughs> <laughs> two sigma. It should be two sigma. In my notes, I have sigma, but now that I think it should be two sigma, right? And this is two sigma, right? That is the point. So what does this tell me about the integral in equation number four? Given that G of R is zero until two sigma, the limits, I can do something, right? What can I do to the limits? I can start from two sigma and how far should I go? Till infinity. And in this range, what is the value of G of R? One, it really simplifies, right? It becomes U one of R multiplied by four pi R square dr. So at this point, I'm not going to do further algebra. I could do it. I need the exact form of the attractive force U1 of R, and then I could integrate this thing and write it down, right? I could do it. But what I'm going to do is to just call this a name, and you should remember the key point that this is an integral of the attractive force. Should this integral be finite? Will it converge or will it diverge? As if, if, if you did not have this term, would this have integral converge or diverge? Definitely diverge, right? So why is that term nice? Because as R tends to infinity, U1 of R goes to zero, right? And now you have to be careful about the scale addition and things like that, but we are not worrying about discontinuity, right? So U1 of R goes to zero as R tends to infinity, right? So this integral is definitely going to converge. How fast? You have to make it fast enough. You have to be certain type of attractive forces. So what we are going to do is to give this integral a name and we will call it minus A 
n rho. Okay. I back introduce no uh, n. That's terrible. Why did I get rid of n? Ugh. That's rho n, right? Rho square v is rho n. So let's call this integral as minus a n rho. So you can see what a is. A is everything except rho n, right? Where a is equal to what is everything except rho n? That is minus one over two, two sigma to infinity u1 of r, 4 pi r squared dr. So normally in physics, I do. Normally in physics, when we introduce something, we like to give it fancy names, right? Let's call it kappa, let's call it mu, let's call it omega. This one we are calling A. Anyone, can anyone guess why? Because when you did PKM or even high school chemistry, the Van der Waals equation of state, the second term is A, right? So that's what I'm trying to allude to. You will see that is exactly this A. So when we do Van der Waals equation of state, we never talk about what is exactly A, but this A is this precise thing for a pair, pair interaction. We haven't, we haven't quite gotten there yet, but we'll get in a moment. But now we have accomplished something phenomenal. Our sad face here can actually become a smiley face because now if we go to equation two, what do we have? Equation two said Zn, is approximately Zn zero e to the power minus beta average value of un one in the reference ensemble. So what we have just shown is that the average value of un one in the reference ensemble is minus a n rho. Let's call this equation five. So put equation five, and this was equation two, in equation two. What do we get? We get Zn is Zn zero e to the power beta a n rho. Right? Does that work for Coulomb force? How quickly do Coulomb forces die? <laughs> yep, you will have a problem. It has to die faster than Coulomb force, right? So Patrick just said, if Coulomb forces, does everyone agree that Coulomb forces, hey, wait a minute, you're tricking me. Coulomb forces don't die one over R. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> tricking me, tricking me. <laughs> it's one over R squared. It will still have an issue. So we will, yeah, it will still diverge. So you have to still, but, so you're kind of right, but not exactly. So it has to die faster than Coulomb forces, right? For it to happen. Now you can think about it, how much faster than Coulomb forces, maybe even tiny amounts faster than Coulomb forces will get the job done. Like, I think that's the case here. And uh, which is part of the problem why Coulomb forces are tricky. I will come to you in a moment. So when you do molecular dynamics, or actually this is, so Feynman has a nice essay on it, the self energy of the electron. Coulomb forces don't die off. They are infinitely long range, they will keep. So if you really want to think about Coulomb forces as attractive, this. Coulomb forces are not perturbation, okay? So this for this to work, perturbation, and this is a great point I'll write down here so I remember next time. Thanks, Patrick, for pointing this out. So perturbation must die quicker than Coulomb. Ever so slightly quicker will get the job done. So how do we deal with quick Coulomb forces? turns out something very interesting. Coulomb forces die very quickly in reciprocal space. So instead of looking at R, if you look at the Fourier space of R, then Coulomb space is easy. So that's what more, most molecular dynamics codes do. For real interactions, they look at uh, real space and for Coulombic interactions, they go to Fourier space. And there are codes known as fast Fourier transforms, which are very, very heavily used for this. Go ahead, Nathan. Can you explain again why G of R goes to one? Large. I would, would G of R be different for the Coulomb potential? No, for any system, uh, rho G of R goes to rho. That is the idea, as R tends to infinity, which is the point that we had on discussion on slides. So rho G of R is not strictly conditional probability, it's like proportional to conditional probability, right? So for any system, 
rho g of r tends to rho. So rho g of r tends to rho as r tends to infinity for every system, any system. That's the idea. Okay, that's the idea. There is, there is no preferential arrangement. It's just going to be density. So once you are beyond the scope of influence of the hard sphere, it's just going to be like the density, right? There is no basis to say that there is a preferential arrangement. That's the idea. So we don't have Van der Waals equation quite yet because we need to deal with Z and zero. We need to calculate. So let's call this as, yeah, please keep asking questions if you have anything. So this is equation number six. And in order to get to Van der Waals equation of state, we have to think about Z and zero. The partition function, partition function for reference part spheres. So how do we do that? <laughs> Before I calculate it, I want to show you how will we get to equation of state from this. Let's say we were able to do that and we got Zn. How would you get pressure from Zn? What we want is equation of state, right? We want pressure as a function of volume and temperature. How would you get pressure from the canonical partition function? Go ahead. So, okay, I have an, another question. Now. Okay. So are we taking the thermodynamic limit at this point? Oh, always. Okay. Always. We live and die in thermodynamic limit. If you, if you care about away from thermodynamic limit and you don't hit stat mic at the end of this semester, then two years from now, which will be, what's two years? 2025 fall. I will be 42. Wow. You should take Chris Jarzinski's class and then you will talk about time dependent behavior and things like that. Remember, there is no time here. None of this, there is no T, there is no small T. You made it. So how do we get pressure from the canonical partition function? Go ahead. Yeah, so how did, again, anytime you have a question like this, you have to think about how do we get any thermodynamics out of canonical partition function, right? And this is a well-defined rule. If you have a micro canonical partition function, what is the thermodynamic quantity? Yes. Eh? Entropy, micro canonical entropy. Canonical Helmholtz energy, grand canonical, grand potential, right? So that's what we know. We know A is equal to minus KBT ln Z. And then how do we get pressure from A? Pressure is equal to minus partial A by partial V, right? Keeping what constant? E and N. N and T. So that looks like we have the right natural variable, right? This is, is, is the canonical partition function. So therefore, you came late, man. <laughs> <laughs> you were not there in last class also, too late. This, this we declared two classes ago that in interacting systems, my Q changed to Z. You're talking about Z and VT. Sorry, it's, it's my fault, but this happened. Yeah, it's the canonical partition function. You're correct. So Q, it's, it's like when you're coding, you can call a function by any name. What matters is what is the variables you're calling into that function, right? So a function is only as good as the variables mm -hmm. that are used to call it. So think about it that way. So this Z here is Z of NVT, it's the canonical partition function. So this was bound to happen because this part of the class I'm using Macquarie, which has another notation, right? So, so, so this means that P by KT is equal to partial ln ZN by partial volume, right? Do you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, so the last thing that we did, that was probably low, uh, high, low beta. Low Everything beta. is low beta, high temperature. But uh, the equation of state is anyway. Yeah, but we are deriving how it comes out at high temperature limit of this interaction. So Van der Waals equation of state is more valid at higher temperature. As you make temperature even higher, even that will become ideal gas law. Like that, right? So this is this is for high temperature. <clears throat> so, and in fact, if you did not want to do only high temperature, then Van der Waals equation of state is not valid. You will have to use the virial equation of state. And I could have done that if I had stuck with the higher beta terms, you would get the virial equation of state. And then you can do any temperature, you get the virial coefficients. So you can experimentally obtain the Van der Waals equation of state. Yeah, but it's approximate. Okay, but that's not necessary. When you talk about high temperatures, generally, what range are we talking 
above room temperature, for example. That's it. Yeah. Definitely, no, let me rephrase it. Definitely not below room temperature. Room temperature is where kind of like quantum mechanics can start to become important. It's, it's a probabilistic thing, right? The higher you are from room temperature, the better it is. Room temperature in here, room temperature not in Siberia. I think, I think the, the main quality that, that you, um, so it's ABT and uh, H bar omega and omega is just Yeah, uh, exactly. So yeah. yeah, you're absolutely correct. So what we really need to think about is KBT relative to H cut omega, right? That's the thing that we have, it's, that defines it. So we have the quantum levels, right? And then we have to, we have to be at a temperature where this is too. But, that's the question, what omega are we thinking about, right? So if you do the you basically see that room temperature is where you can't get into this soft, safe region, okay? You can also take care of the low density. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so let's do this. So in order, so let's call this equation number seven. And let's put equation six in seven. Put six in seven. So equation six was the expression, how Zn dependent on Zn naught and a to power beta a n rho, okay? So this will be, P by KT is therefore equal to partial LN ZN naught by partial volume plus partial beta AN rho by partial volume. Let's figure out the second part over here and then we will come back to the LN thing. So this, we are going to keep it the way it is, partial LN zero by partial volume. This one, how do we do this integral? Really? You had this in the homework? Oh, really? Oh, cool. So in order to do this, we are going to put rho as n by v, right? So this is partial beta a n square by v, by partial v. Okay? So good that you've seen it in the homework. So a beta can come outside the integral, right? Because why can it come outside? Because, well, what is being held constant here? N and T. So what can come outside? N, A and beta can come outside, right? So this will become partial LN ZN naught by partial V plus beta A N square D of one over V by DV. What is D of one over V by DV? Minus one over V square, right? So this becomes partial ln zn naught by partial volume plus beta a n square minus one over v square. And now we can reintroduce rho, rho is n over v, right? So this is partial ln zn naught by partial volume minus beta a rho square. Okay, now we really need to deal with this partial ln z naught by partial, partial ln z naught by partial b. So we need to calculate for this purpose, the partition function of the reference hard sphere system. Any system partition function will have two parts. It will have the kinetic energy part. It will have the position part, right? Do we need to worry about the kinetic energy part for this one? No, because we are differentiating with respect to volume. So that's going to completely disappear, right? So, so P by KT is equal to this thing. Let's call this equation number eight. So, what is page number? It's page number seven. For equation eight, Z and zero, only configurational part matters. So what is the configuration part? What is the configurational part, uh, partition function for a gas made up of N hard spheres? Jared, what do you think? Let me simplify it. What is the partition function for an, what is the configurational partition function for an ideal gas made up of n point particles. So, 
when you integrate with respect to dr, what is e to the power minus beta u r? Zero. Sorry, it's one because u is zero for a point particle, right? So if this was ideal gas, like point particle, what would this quantity be? If you do that integral, you have to do it for every single particle and they will all be the same integral. What is the value of that integral? You have done it in homeworks. Is the volume. Integral dr is the volume, right? So this is v to the power n. And we can be careful and divide it by one by n factorial, right? Now you don't have ideal gas. You have hard sphere. What will this integral look like? You will again have the same one over n factorial because they are, and it won't matter for the purpose of equation number eight. If you did one over n factorial, it will just disappear, right? What should I have over here? The whole volume, so the integral is now restricted to a certain volume, right? So here we had integral dr. Now we have integral dr restricted outside Hart sphere, right? What is that going to be? That's going to be, you have to be a bit careful and we can argue over this, but I'm just going to write it in the following form and then tell you what is this thing. So this nb will be volume of each sphere. So four pi sigma cube by three, right? Multiplied by n because we have n such spheres. So that is the excluded volume. And this is where we can argue. I would claim that you have to divide by two. If you don't divide by two, then you have over counting. If you don't like it, it's okay. You basically get an idea is related to the volume. Okay, maybe volume or the double of volume. So now let's differentiate log. So what is log Zn naught? Log Zn naught is equal to minus log n factorial plus n log v minus nb, right? If I differentiate it with respect to volume, the first term does not matter. It's just n factorial. What is the second term going to be? n by v minus nb, right? There we go, now we are ready. We put equation nine, put nine in eight. What do we get? P by KT is this partial over volume, right? So P by KT is equal to N by V minus NB. Minus A rho square by kt. You can do two things. You can take this n and bring it to the denominator. No, actually what you can do is you divide by volume, numerator and denominator. So divide this thing, numerator by volume and divide denominator also by volume. What do you get? You get p by kt is equal to rho by, you are dividing. So one minus b rho minus a rho square by kt. Where did that kt come from? Like the a rho square? Beta. Beta is one over kt. It came from the fact that a is equal to minus one over beta ln z. So this is Van der Waals equation of state, right? Normally you don't see it like, normally you see it like not in rho, but n over b, but it's the same thing. So you can see it's, and, and again, I like this derivation a lot because now we know where a comes from, right? And we know that if you're trying to describe, yeah, one moment, if you're trying to describe a system which is primarily Coulombic interaction, then Van der Waals equation of state is probably not a good idea, right? Because A will diverge, right? That integral will diverge. Go ahead, Alex. I'm also going to get from the classroom, but uh, the uh, partition function should be uh, proportional to some factor depending on momentum. Which oh man, you're still asleep. asleep. That's what I said. We are going to, diff that's the only configuration part. It does not depend on volume. The Hamiltonian of the system, the momentum part, 
that's you're you're absolutely correct. The true partition function is a product of momentum partition function into uh, coordinate partition function, right? But the coordinate partition function depends on R, and momentum partition function depends on P, right? Momentum has no sense of volume. Momentum is different from volume. So okay. when you differentiate it, it disappears. Yeah, dimensionless, so we can do this work. Not even dimensionless. Momentum just does not depend on R. They are orthogonal. They are conjugate variables. So it, it differentiates. You can write it down. You can write down the whole thing, right? We can actually do this. We know what it is, right? It is square root of 2 pi mkt, right? Divided by something. Does that depend on volume? No, right? So you can differentiate. That's why it drops off. So you're absolutely correct. It, it is there. It's not that Z and zero is equal to this. Only configuration part, because we don't care. And we, we could do this because we know we are going to differentiate it, right? That's why we could pull this off. So we got the Van der Waals equation of state. Now, <clears throat> what Kinjal asked earlier is not just low beta, but higher beta. In higher betas, you can naturally see what type of terms will start to emerge. You will have, this is, this term over here is one over beta, is, is, is term proportional to beta, right? As you go to higher beta, you will get other terms that show up there. And, and you can derive this if you follow the picture that I showed, you just have to be very careful in your bookkeeping. And you will get a physical sense for those terms also. So for those of you who don't remember Van der Waals equation of state, this is telling you that if you look at the first, if, if you ignored everything in this equation and you take P by KT is equal to rho, that's ideal gas law, right? And on top of that, right, P by K2 is equal to rho is the same as P V is equal to M and KT. On top of that, you're saying that everything has a finite volume. Particles have a finite volume. So you have that correction. And on top of that, you have attractive forces. And the attractive forces tend to reduce the pressure, right? Because this is something we discussed in the beginning of 684. If you have attraction in the system, you are not trying to bang against the walls. You're not trying to escape. You're trying to come inside. And attractive, so, Pressure is a measure of how desperately you're trying to escape the container that you are from. And if you have repulsive forces, that's going to increase. If you have attractive forces, that's going to decrease. So the presence of attractive forces brings this thing down. But if the attractive forces were dying at Columbic or faster rate, then when there was the question of state, this way is not a good idea. You will, you will have to think of it more carefully. Any questions about this? Go ahead, please. <laughs> DR for outside, so DR uh, ranges from 2 sigma to... Mm -hmm. So it should be something like uh, B to the power N minus? No, the power N will be constant. What the term that even I am actually still confused about is this half term. That's a bit fudgy. The power is still, still the same. The reason power is the same. Why is power the same? Why should it be to the power N? The same, so same particle. It's what independent. I, what I mean is that rise and b to the power n minus n to the power n. Oh, what? b to the power what? b to the power n minus n b to the power n. You are saying v to the power n minus something like this? No. You are sub. How can you subtract partition functions? Anything that you do here. You have so to. The R ranges from. Uh, that's what, uh, that's no, no, no. The R ranges from. Uh, okay, okay, I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. So if this confuses you, think about one, forget about n particles. Think about just one hard sphere, okay? If you just think about one hard sphere, what will be the partition function? That would be V minus some volume B, right? And this will be the same for every hard sphere. So you will have V minus B multiplied by V minus B multiplied by V minus B. And I confess that I did some fudging in exactly what B is. It's something related to sigma Q, okay? Multiplied by some free factor. It's something that depends on the volume. Okay, so. No, so uh, I don't know. So why, how is N coming here? Because the excluded volume for every particle depends on how many other particles you have. No, no, uh, yeah. But, uh... Why, what's wrong with that? Which N are you talking about? Power N, that you know why it's okay. coming. Uh, Which N, are you talking okay. about this inside N? Yeah, yeah, inside, yeah. Because the excluded volume is coming from every other particle. If I really packed up, let's imagine the, the a limiting case where the spheres are actually squares, right? Or cubes. We can pack cubes perfectly inside a room, right? 
imagine if you had so many cubes that it was perfectly stacked, then this volume would be really, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. it would depend on the number of things you have, right? From the integration perspective, it comes from the fact that the internal limit is, the lower limit is becoming higher due to the presence of the other particles. That's where it comes from. The lower limit is not effectively starting at two sigma, it's starting at a higher number because the volume is blocked out. Don't, don't think too hard. You'll get confused, don't think too hard. I mean, think hard, but not for this one. Some points I will ask you to think hard, but not for this one. It is a limiting expansion that you have to consider that if, think about it is as if, if are you happy with this expression if sigma went to zero? So you're thinking about if hard sphere, which are not like crazy big, hard spheres of a small finite radius. Okay, that's how you're thinking about it. If think, okay, think hard about it. Let me rephrase when you go home. And if it's still not clear, send me a message and stuff. Okay. So I'm gonna proceed further and start Ising model now. So let me recap this semester so far what we have done. We really had <clears throat> four parts. This is done. I have copy, don't worry. This is remaining. So we had four parts to this semester. What was part one? No, man, we are not talking about negative time. That was part zero. Part one was really our intro to Ergo to City, right? That was the first postulate we had. What was the second postulate we had? Equal. Oh, equal a priori probabilities, right? And equal a priori probabilities. Which meant that if you know nothing about the system, then all microstates are equally possible, right? And that led us to the concept of a microcanonical partition function, which depended on NVE. We connected it to thermo through S. Then we went to Q, which was NVT. We connected it to thermo through Helmholtz free energy. And here the idea was it's not isolated, it's exchanging heat until it comes to thermal equilibrium, right? Then we got, went to grand canonical partition function, which is a number can also exchange. So we had mu VT and that depended on the grand potential, which was actually minus PV. Was it minus PV or plus PV? Minus PV, okay. So this was depending on the choice of your environment, you get different ensemble. We showed all of them are consistent in the thermodynamic limit, right? They give you the same information. And this is a question that will definitely matter in your final exam. Which ensemble should I pick? So think hard before proceeding, right? Just if the problem might not say it's temperature or not, you have to decide which ensemble you're going to work in. <clears throat> we talked about averages of thermodynamic quantities from the ensemble, right? How did we calculate average of any quantity, any observable O? The average is given as going to a microstate, calculating the value of the microstate observable in that microstate and multiplying by the probability of that microstate, right? And the question then is, which P nu should we take, right? That depends on the choice of the ensemble. If it's omega, then P nu is equal to one over P volume, right? If it's Q, then P nu is proportional to e to the power minus beta E nu. If it's grand canonical, then P nu is proportional to e to the power minus beta E nu minus mu and nu, right? So we set up the machinery. The first part of the course was really setting up the machinery. We also talked about fluctuations in observables, right? We did it for a variety of systems. We derived a very generic properties for fluctuations. Anyone remembers what they were? one over square root of n. This was independent of ensemble, right? In the thermodynamic limit fluctuations, the square root, so the standard deviation divided by mean goes as one over square root of n. And this is really a profound property due to central limit theorem. And you saw this for many things. You saw this for how this was useful for heat capacity, how this was useful for uh, average number of particle fluctuations and things like that. 
So we did all this and some related things. Then we went to part two. Anyone remembers what was part two of the course? Non-interacting systems, right? We talked about, what did we talk about there? We studied phonons, right? We talked about density of states. Who was lazy, Einstein or Dewey? Einstein. See, this is a question I'm gonna ask on your calls. It doesn't matter whether he scored high on Stagnac or not. I'm gonna ask you. This is just everywhere. Phonons, we did classical harmonic oscillator. We did quantum harmonic oscillator, right? In quantum harmonic oscillator, we had two models, Debye and Einstein, and we study all these things in great detail. We, what did we do after phonons? Did we do photons or electrons first? Yeah, that order doesn't matter. We did photons, we did electrons, and all of these were non-interacting. And a common theme in all of these was to think about the density of states and things like that, right? Which can be obtained through experiments or we assume a model. And we got all sorts of wonderful properties out of this. And then I showed you a general framework for fermions and bosons, right? Which is quantum particles. And then I showed you that at high T, low density, both of these give you classical limit, remember? Which was one over n factorial. And it was important that it has to be low density. You saw this hopefully, was it in this homework or the previous homework? Previous homework, you saw hopefully that why it can lead to problems if you have finite number of states, right? You have to have a lot of states and very few particles for that to work. So we justified our approximation of one over n factorial, which I like a lot because it's the only time I have seen Sterling's formula being used in rewards, right? It just came out of that. Then we moved to part three, which was interacting systems. So part three and part four are both are really interacting systems. That's common. However, in part three, we looked at fluids. Right? We looked at concepts such as G of R, which give us the conditional probability of finding another particle given something is as a particular rotation, right? We connected G of R, Chandler talks about it, you can read more and already I'm happy to see that those of you who are in experimental groups can already see why this is important. You can measure this in your transcattering and things like that, right? And we showed how you can get thermodynamics out of it and it's powerful. We derived Zwanzig's relation, which is exact and we derived, uh, uh, so is one six perturbation, perturbation relation, and we derived some approximation to it. We did tell that. Now we are ready for part four, which will be quick. Part four, we are going to talk about interacting systems, but we will talk about a very generic phenomenon, which is known as phase transitions. And in order to study phase transitions, we will use a model system, which is known as the Ising model. I got into research due to the Ising model when I was a second year undergrad, I did a project on it and I definitely bothered the shit out of my undergrad engineering teacher. I would just quote it and get all sorts of bizarre behavior and he was like, go away, go away, I don't want to see you. But it's really, really powerful. Even though I was doing engineering, I was using it to model what is known as stacking faults in a crystal. So it's really, really, really powerful. And it has led to directly or indirectly to two Nobel prizes. The first Nobel prize went to Ansagar for work he actually did as a PhD student, believe it or not. And the second Nobel Prize went to Ken Wilson. And uh, this, most of the work Ken Wilson did for this was a paper authored by Wilson and Fisher. You all have been here much after, Michael Fisher used to be in IPST. He would be walking around the second floor outside your room, just looking at everyone. And he passed away around three, four years ago. And uh, Wilson in his Nobel Prize, citation and other stuff says that, I don't know why they did not give it to Fisher. They should really have given it to Fisher, but they did not only go from that. So, and they won it for something known as renormalization group theory. And I will give you a basic flavor for what that is. So we have, this is a fun part of the semester. And uh, it's quite likely that even though, I, so I've written on Slack or on the website, what is the last class, but it's quite possible that for real renormalization group, I go one class further. It won't be on the exam. Those of if any one student shows up here, I will cover it. If no one shows up, then I will probably not cover it. So let's start with Ising model and why this is a model for phase transitions and what do we mean by, mean by all of this. First of all, an ideal system, point-like particles, will it show different phases? 
it's just ideal gas, right? There is no existence of phases. Will a hard sphere show different phases? Yes or no? Yes. No. It has to have some anisotropy. So my postdoc, Eric Bairley, is studying this. In order to get this nematic is to on side. There are transitions that you can get in hard interactions, but it doesn't have to be symmetric. It doesn't have to be spherical. It has to be like an ellipsoid in order to get the transition. You know? So the point I'm trying to make here is that anytime you want, and we know phases exist, right? In thermo, we studied phase diagrams, right? So ideal gas won't give you a phase diagram. Remember, in order to get a phase diagram, the critical point, we had to use the Van der Waals equation of sleep. It's flashback, but, but if you really think, if you really try to meditate, you will remember we showed how Van der Waals equation of state is a cubic equation and it has three solutions, right? And we got to critical point and things like that. And that's how we got to phase. And how did we get Van der Waals equation of state? By this U1 term through the attraction term through the hard sphere interaction plus some attractive interaction. So the point being that phases arise in interacting systems. Okay, and we want to study how do phases arise? When do phases arise? What do we have to do in order for the phase to arise? How quickly does it arise? How quickly does it disappear? All this kind of business. So in order to study this, I will just introduce the Ising model today and, and tell you about the problem that we are going to solve starting next class. So the Ising, Ising model looks like <clears throat> small magnets. That's the easiest way to think about it. So imagine a Vondi system where you have a magnet that can face up and you have a magnet, the same magnet can face down also. So it could look something like this. All of them are facing up. Suddenly two of them are facing down and the rest that are facing up. So if you have played with small magnets in any, I, I don't know which. Oh yeah, has anyone played the game Ludo? Or snakes and ladders, you know, all those games, you would have these small things that you can put on the board and they would have magnets in order to stick with it. But just if you have not played that, it's okay. But just remember, imagine small magnets, right? You know that the magnets have poles, right? They fall in a certain, they point in a certain direction. When you place a magnet, how, how does it point? It tries to orient along the magnetic field of the earth. So, it, so there is a big magnetic field, we call it edge. And all of these magnets will actually try to align something like this, right? Is the magnetic field of the earth constant or can it change? How quickly? It's gladly it's not 10 years or 50 years. And I think it's around 100,000 years. So people, a lot of people are very scared about it because can you imagine, right? The North Pole becomes South Pole and things like that. So every 100,000 years or so, the magnetic field of the earth flips. And the last transition that happened, some people are suspect that it led to like mass extinctions and things like that, right? So we won't worry about that. There is some external magnetic field over here. Yeah, exactly, yeah, we can see. So, so the small magnets align themselves along or against it, right? So, but there is also an interaction between the different magnets, right? They are also talking to each other. If you did not have the external field, just forget about the external field. And if you have one magnet, which is falling, uh, pointing north-south, and the other one, which is pointing south-north, if you try to align them, you know what happens, right? It tries to rotate. Have you done this? You must have played with it at some point, right? It tries to rotate and just goes like this, right? So if you did not have an external magnetic field, and that's the scenario we are really going to talk about for now, the magnets will probably try to align something like this, right? if you have real world magnets. Now, we are going to think about it from a mathematical perspective, okay? We are going to call these magnets as spins, okay? This one is spin number one, S1, this is spin number two, this is spin number three, spin number four, so on and so forth. And we are going to say that uh, magnet up is S i, if i is up, this is SI is equal to plus one. By the way, today's class will run two minutes late and I request you to stay with me, okay? Until they kick us out because I want to finish the intuitive picture and then we'll stop. I, I, I normally try not that to happen today. So. 
and we call if it's down as SI is equal to minus one. Okay, so so this thing that you have magnets pointing up, down, up, down can also be written as plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, right? Something like that, right? So let's write down a Hamiltonian, an energy functional for such a system. Hamiltonian is also denoted as H, not to be confused with the external magnetic field. It's really bad lingo, but that's what it is. Not to be confused with this. And the good news is that we are not really going to talk about external magnetic field, so it won't matter. So this Hamiltonian can be written as an interaction. Do I need to talk about Hamiltonian? Let's, let's, for, let's do the Hamiltonian next time, okay? We will talk, I, I want to give you the intuitive picture for what we, we are trying to do about that. The math will come next time. So think about these magnets, forget about Hamiltonian or anything, okay? So in the absence of an uh, external magnetic field, we agreed that the small magnets are going to align something like this, right? So if I think about the average magnetic moment for this thing, what's that going to look like? It's going to look like zero, right? If you go to very high, so, but this is when each magnet tries to align opposite of its neighboring magnet, right? Real world magnets are going to be like that. But what we are going to think about is magnets which might not have this sort of coupling, magnets which try to align like their neighbor. So it's not real world magnet, it's a generalization of a real world magnet, right? So we are going to think of magnets that like their neighbors. So at t is equal to zero, these magnets will look as this, okay? Tricky point, they can also look exactly opposite. And we are not going to talk, we are, we'll talk about that degeneracy later, but the point being they will all look like the same. So if you have n such magnets, what is the average value of the spin now? One, right? So it's average over all spins. But at t tends to infinity, what would you expect intuitively this thing to become, even though they like each other? Zero. Right? They like each other, but there is so much thermal fluctuation that one is top, one is bottom, it just doesn't matter, right? Average S will go to zero, right? So here is the main problem for which the Nobel Prize was given, not just one, but twice, that we are trying, trying to solve. The problem that we are trying to solve is how does average S look like as a function of temperature? We know that at zero temperature, it's going to be one. At very high temperature, it's going to be zero, right? So it turns out for most practical system, for almost everything, it looks like follows. It drops down and there is a certain temperature at which it goes to zero. This temperature is known as the critical temperature, okay? So in 3D, it looks something like this for 3D magnets, okay? So not just along one line, but along a cube. Here comes the very interesting part. If you went to 2D magnets, it would look like this. And we are going to show why. That the critical temperature for a 2D system is always lower than the critical temperature for a 3D system. What happens in 1D? Anyone knows? Well, I'll tell you. Something very bizarre happens. The critical temperature becomes zero. So a 1D system cannot have phase transitions. And I will Next time I will do the math for this Ising model. I will write it down. Then I will show you using what is known as the Pearl's droplet argument that why a 1D system, the critical temperature is indeed zero, which means that if you have 1D magnets, the best way to think about it is like that game Jenga. You pull any one thing and the whole thing falls unless you are very careful, right? If it's 2D, you can pull one thing and it can still survive. If it's 3D, you can pull a few things it can really survive, not in 1D. Then I will show you this theory known as mean field theory gets it wrong. Mean field theory tells you you can have a critical temperature even in one day and renormalization group theory actually gets it right. So this is the agenda for the remaining classes. Thank you for staying late.